much. A couple of quick announcements before we get uh, moving any further. Remember, today is our Thanksgiving dinner. Don't worry if you haven't brought anything. There's some amazing things that are here to eat. We're going to be okay with that. Um, also, don't forget the children's Christmas party and play, play, play <laughs> children's Christmas party play practice. Yeah, say that real fast. December 14th. Also, <clears throat> Hanging of the Greens. If you've never been to a Hanging of the Greens, it's next Sunday evening. Uh, instead of small groups, we'll all gather here, and it's a wonderful, wonderful time. Tells of the traditions of why we do what we do. Tells about a lot of wonderful things, and if you've never been a part of that or seen anything like that, it's really, really exciting what that is all about. A lot of great things that are in our bulletin, so make yourself aware of everything that we are doing. One of the beautiful things that we are able to do is give back to God just a portion of what Pam has to offer. That's right. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I'm going to enter I don't know. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to enter the service really quick. You didn't know we were going to do this this morning. Um, today, since it's our Thanksgiving meal and since we're talking and it's the time of year we're talking about things we're thankful for, we just wanted to let, as a church, let Pastor Lonnie know that we were so thankful for him and all he's done for our church over the past four years? Four years now that he's been here. And it's just been an amazing transformation. And I know the ones that were here before can see it, the new people that are here. It's wonderful having y'all, and I know y'all appreciate him too. And we just want to tell you that we love you and we're thankful for everything you've done for our church. And we're Well, thank you so much. It means a lot. I really do appreciate that. And uh, what an honor to be, let me, let me say this, what an honor to be the pastor of this church. Uh, it's amazing to be called into the ministry, but to actually have a church where you feel like you're home and where God is moving and things are going where you want them to go. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. Thank you so much, church family. Uh, we love you guys, and we really do appreciate that. Now... We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. If our ushers will come. <laughs> Father God, what a blessing to be in your house today. Thank you so much for everything that you have done and everything you are doing. God, we are blessed beyond belief. And Father, today we say thank you. Thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. God, we are honored. We are humbled. Would you bless each gift? Bless each giver, make this offering, help it to further your kingdom. And God, we ask this in your name. Amen.
Thank you so much, Debbie. Each and every week, doesn't she do a good job of all of this? It's really tough. Reading the Psalms today in, in uh, Psalms 95, the scripture is really important. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. It's pretty much what we are doing right now. <clears throat> For the Lord is the great God, large G, the great king above all gods, little g. Anytime you see that in the scripture, when they re reference to God, the king, the Lord, it's big G. When they reference other gods, sun god, uh, cloud god, land god, it's little g because those are idols. And those are the ones that sometimes we get caught up in. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. As we prepare our hearts and we sing these songs, we're not just singing a song just to sing a song, just to make it a feel good. Well, I feel good because we sang that song today. Or I feel good because we didn't sing that song today. Or, or what it is. This is worship. I feel good because I'm not singing a song so everybody can hear. I'm honoring God and I'm worshiping Him. For the Lord is the great God. Looking back over this past year, I can see God's hand moving in my life. All of the things that are coming into place and all the things that are happening. And I would venture to say that if we were to look back one year, you would say God has moved in my life. Because each and every day we wake up with fresh opportunities and that's God's way of saying today is fresh, today is new. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Psalms 95 verses 2 and 3. I would like for you to read this with me out loud and kind of make this your, your, your Psalms of the day. Giving thanks. That's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes is how are we giving thanks? What are we giving thanks for? And it should be every little thing that happens in our life, we give thanks to God. So today, let's read this. Psalms 95, verse 2 and 3. Read it with me out loud. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. One more time. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Remain standing as we sing.
finish up that song, and it's an amazing little song, and give thanks. Sometimes we, we overlook the little things that God does in our life that leads to the big things. Because sometimes we're in a place where we want the parting of the Red Sea. We want the burning bush miracles. We want all of these big things. And sometimes God, I believe, looks down on us and says, you know, you're not even giving thanks for the little things. You're not even giving thanks because... And so we pause and we say, thank you, God. And as we say, thank you, God, then we pour out our hearts in prayers. We set aside just a portion of this service for a time of prayer. The praise team's going to sing a little bit more, but I think we have a lot to be grateful for. And I think we have a lot that we need. Especially in the holiday season when not everybody is giving thanks because not everybody, not everybody enjoys holidays because of various reasons. And the truth is, the holidays can be such a lonely place and a lonely time. So we need to pray. God, here I am. Broken, lonely. God, here I am facing another time. God, here I am. Whatever your prayer is, as the praise team sings, and as we sing the song, give thanks. If you want to come and pray, just kneel around these altars. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to tap you on the shoulder. You don't have to be a member of the church to come and pray. It's just an opportunity to give thanks. It's an opportunity to give God praise. It's an opportunity to come and to say, God, here I am. And here's my life issue. So as their praise team are singing, if you want to come, just step out as they start singing. God, thank you for continuing to do a mighty work. Father, we, we come to you today on a, on a Sabbath day, a, a Sunday, a holy day, setting aside a portion for prayer, but giving thanks. Father, would you bind it in our heart that each and every day we should start with giving thanks and giving praise. Each and every day we should just be grateful what you are doing. We look around and we see so many beautiful things. We see families that are coming to church together. We see lives that are being transformed. We see things that are happening in people's lives that we can't mention because it's been a private prayer. And God, we are just grateful. We are honored that you are here with us and we are pri privileged to be in this house because so many people around the world are being persecuted for their faith. And God, here I am saying thank you. Thank you for the blessings that you have given me personally. Thank you for an incredible week. And God, thank you just for being God. And Father, there are people that are carrying prayer requests with them. Wednesday night, we pray for so many people that are hurting the body that is broken. We pray for families, siblings, friends, co-workers. God, we pray for the people, the people of this community. May we see each person that we greet as a person that was created by you. May we, we take off the blinders and see people the way that you see them. May we reach 
farther than we've ever reached before in our life. May we go deeper than we've ever been in our life with our spiritual walk. And God, may we just be the hands and feet to help those that are hurting and lost. May we be your voice in a wilderness. And God, thank you for opportunities to serve. Thank you for opportunities to, to witness. Thank you for opportunities to gather as we are gathering today and we are saying thank you so much, God, for all of the blessings, all of the things that you are doing in our life. God, they're so numerous. And as we lift these prayers to you, my heart goes out to those that are being lifted right now, those that are unable to be here today for whatever reason, those that are physically sick, those that may be going through something. Father, whatever it is right now, God, I pray that you will be, you'll be ever present in their lives. And God, today, as we, we continue to give thanks, Father, may the songs that we sing, may the testimonies that we speak, may the words that are spoken in a message bring honor and praise to you. And God, thank you just for being God and loving us unconditionally. God, give us all a blessing. Help us to have an amazing time. We ask this in your name. Amen.
thank you so much. I hope you're grateful for the things that he has done <coughs> in your life. And so grateful for the things that he is going to do. And it's just an amazing time. Right now, we want to dismiss all of our children for Children's Church. You guys are leading the way. And for that, we are grateful. I want to show you a little video. that You've probably seen this one before, but it, it really is a reminder of giving thanks. for us to remind ourselves that each and every day is a gift and every time we go through just routine it is a blessing and it is a gift well today is one of the hardest days to preach literally because you can smell food <laughs> and I know a lot of you are going if this guy would just hurry up we can get right to the to the turkey and, um, <laughs> and some of you are going we got one up on the platform right now <laughs> we can get right to the turkey and much Right after that, we can get the trip to fin to kick in and we can take that glorious nap that comes after you eat a lot of pie. So we're going to have a great day. Today we're going to look at 1 Peter. And as you look at the way Peter wrote, he was very, very direct over and over and over and over again. He said, this world is not my home. This world is not your home. He's reminding us that we are to live a life that is to be honoring God in everything we say and do. And we're to honor him in various ways. And today I want to bring to you what I believe is probably the most encouraging message that you don't want to hear. You don't want to hear this, but it's going to be encouraging. But I want to start off with some uh, different things that Jesus did not promise us. Jesus did not promise these things. So here we go. These are things that Jesus did not promise us. Number one, Jesus never promised us that everybody would be right. Never said that. Nobody said everybody would be right. 
Jesus never promised it would not rain on your vacation. Jesus never promised that. We pray for rain and then we take our time away and we go, Lord, why is it raining? So there we go. Here's another one. Jesus never promised that you would not get your heart broken by someone you're dating. Never promised that. And here's another one. Jesus never promised that your plumbing would not back up. He never promised that. And so we, we look at this and we go, these are bad days. And Jesus never promised us a lot of things. But here's what he did promise us. Here's something that we did because you put it in perspective. Here's what Jesus did promise us. Jesus did promise, or he said, in, in, uh, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Jesus promised us that the world would persecute us and that people will hate you. Here's the other one. John chapter 15, uh, 10, 15 verse 20. It says this, remember what I told you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Jesus promised us this, and he said, you're going to be persecuted for your faith. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be laughed at. You're going to be mocked by your family. There's going to be people going, you're crazy. Why do you go to church all the time? Why are you always at the church? Why are you doing this? Why are you giving your money to the church? Why are you doing this? Blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on and on and on, and people don't really understand it. I want to give you a little background in the context because Peter was writing to first century Gentile Christians during the time of extreme persecution. It was really a time of this. They were being literally often tortured under Nero. We've spoken about Nero before. We've spoken about how he used to dip people in oil and he'd dip them in a wax kind of substance and he'd put them on a stick and then he would light them up and he'd have a party in his garden and that was his torches. And he blamed a lot of other things also. But he also wanted to tear down Rome because he was a builder. He wanted to build a new city. But all of the people said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, so we, we can't do that. We're not going to spend our money on that. So they, all the people got together, the, the leaders, and they went, no, we're not going to do that. So what he did is he actually hired people to burn down parts of the city. He would hire them to burn down parts of the city. Then he would blame it on the Christians. Well, the Christians do that because the Christians are opposed to what we're doing, right? So the Christians did it, and so he, then he would have them set on fire. And so these followers were extraordinary persecution under a very, very evil man. Well, I hope you, you'll understand, don't close your eyes for any length of time, that the world is really kind of reverting back to, we go in cyclical, it's a cyclical type of thing. In fact, most people would argue um, that right now, in modern times, persecution of Christians is at the all-time high. It's at an all-time high. Now, almost every article you read says that in the last decade has represented the worst decade in the history of Christian persecution <coughs> around the world. Now, when we read about it, we kind of go, this is bad. We, Americans, have never really been persecuted for our faith. We've never really been persecuted for our faith. In the context of the way that people overseas are being persecuted for their faith. In the Muslim worlds, in the Islamic worlds, in all of these other worlds that are dominant, Christians are in the minority, and so they're being persecuted. What we think of persecution is literally they're taking our prayer away from us in school, or they're not allowing us to do something at a football game, or we're being persecuted because of this. That's really not persecution. That's just people being judgmental. And that's what Jesus says. Jesus came and he says, you know what? Um, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So this is nothing new to us. It's nothing new to us. So in just this staggering statistics, in an average month around the world, over 300 Christians are killed for following Jesus. 200 churches would be burned or completely destroyed in an average 30-day period. There's upwards close to 800 followers of Christ who would be beaten, tortured, raped, or imprisoned for following their faith around the world. This is what they are doing around the world. And Jesus says, if you follow me, the world will hate you and you will be persecuted. And that's why today this will be, for many of you, the most encouraging, <laughs> discouraging message you'll ever hear. Because of our faith, but we are comfortable in church on Sundays. We're comfortable. We have air conditioning. We have heaters. We have padded chairs. We turn the lights off during the music so you can go to sleep. We turn them on to see who's awake. We go through all of these motions. We kind of do this kind of crazy stuff. And we just kind of go through the routine of this. And here's what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Or Jesus did promise that the world will hate you. But here's what he says. Dear friends, 
Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Uh, he's telling these people who are hurting, don't be shocked, don't be surprised that you're living boldly for Jesus and that you would face opposition. Understanding this is biblical times. And he's going, you know what? They're being persecuted. They're being tortured. In the middle of the field of where they are doing this stuff, Jesus is telling Peter, and Peter is going, wow, this is really true. So Peter's telling the church, and he's saying, you know, there's people being tortured all around us. And Jesus said that if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And so it would be easy for you, new early Christians, to walk away. But praise Jesus, they didn't do that because if they did, we would not be here today. And so we, the, he's telling these people who are hurting, don't be shocked, don't be surprised. You live boldly. If you're set apart, if you're different, then, then you, you need to be different. You need to act different. You need to look different. You need to be different. You need to challenge yourself to say, I am set apart from. In other words, we can go to church, but we can't really be set apart unless we get involved. And, and how do I know this? Well, I brought something today. It's going to kind of share with you something. And uh, hypothetic, hypothetically, let's just imagine, nobody likes to play sports hardly, but let's just imagine you're on a sports team. Okay. You're on a sports team and you're a big fan. We moved to Wyoming, and I was introduced to this beautiful game called hockey. People in the South are like, hockey? That's a northern. Well, it is. But the first game I ever went to is when these two teams got together, and they didn't even drop the puck. They just started punching each other. And I went, I love this sport. <laughs> so let's hypothetically say you're on a hockey team. Okay? Let's hypothetically say you go to church. Let me demonstrate. So you wouldn't get the thing. All right, so here I am in a hockey jersey, and you're like, this is crazy. Yeah, but here's the thing. I've got the jersey on, but I don't know how to play the sport. I don't know how to do it. I had to be taught how to play this game called hockey. I still don't know. I've never played the game hockey, but I consider myself a big fan. Because here's the thing. I may be a fan, but I'm not on the team. I may own the jersey, but I don't belong. And let me be honest with you, if the enemy, if the other team, I show up and I go, we're going to play the Detroit Red Wings. And if you don't know, they're the arch enemies of these Colorado Avalanche. And so we're sitting here and I'm going, hey, I'm going to play against you guys. And they look at me and they go, we got this. They are not scared whatsoever. They are not intimidated whatsoever. Why? Because I'm wearing a hockey jersey and that guy right there, he's all clumsy. He looks like a brand new born deer. He doesn't know how to skate. He can't even skate backwards. He doesn't even know what to do. He doesn't even know how to do this. He doesn't know the basics. He doesn't understand all of these crazy things. The enemy is not afraid of me. At all. Period. At all. Scripture says, consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you endure trials of any kind. Because you are standing for Christ. And the enemy is afraid. Now, if you look at me and you go, it's a hockey jersey, you're, you're not intimidating. You're not intimidating. Spiritually speaking, you're not intimidating. So I clothe myself with what God wants me to do. I clothe myself in the spiritual world. And I quit pretending that I'm a Christian. I quit putting on my Sunday best and sitting in a church service. I quit pretending that I know the scripture in my head, but I don't apply it to my heart. I quit pretending and I quit playing this game and I become real at who it is. And all of a sudden, the enemy looks at me differently. What about now? 
Now what do I look like? Because I'm prepared. I'm prepared to face the enemy. And the enemy understands I know the scripture. The enemy understands I'm fighting the fight. The enemy understands I'm not going to bow down and I'm not going to cower. The enemy says, I'm afraid of that guy because he comes to church to worship. He comes to church to learn. He's not just wearing the jersey. He's not just putting the clothes on. He's not just pretending. He's in the game. He's understanding the consequences. Do not worry, dear friends and brothers. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that you're about to face. Do not be af af afraid. Because scripture tells me perfectly, and if I listen to what the Bible says, and I read it, and I apply it to my life, and I don't just read it to have a good knowledge of it, but I have a grasp of it, and I've applied it to my life, and now I'm being transformed into the image of Christ, and here's what the Bible says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. It also says, no weapon formed against you will harm you if God is against before you. No weapon no weapon made by man will do anything to you, but they will persecute you. But if you endure these fiery trials, here's what happens. I'm in the game, and I've got the enemy scared. And that's my goal. You see, most Christians like to do it this way. Don't wake up the enemy. Don't wake up the enemy because, you know, you're going to have some dangerous stuff come your way, and the enemy's going to be this and the enemy is going to try to attack you and, and the enemy and I'm going I'm tired of giving the enemy credit I'm tired of it we should be more powerful than our enemy because we serve a God that is living we serve a God that is loving we serve a God that is caring we serve a God that took a person and transformed that life into a beautiful beautiful broken life am I perfect no. Am I being perfected? Every day. Do I make mistakes? Talk to my wife. <laughs> yes. Yes. But you know what? I'm fighting. I'm fighting. And I give thanks. Because I'm not just wearing a jersey. I'm in the game. And it's weary. And it's hard, and it's beautiful, and it's good. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Because most of us, you got the jersey on, but you're not in the game. That's us. You got the jersey on, not in the game. Not in the game. And it's hard to say. Because I believe sometimes giving thanks in the bad times overshadows thanks in the good times. So if we're to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, if we're to be not surprised by the fiery trials that are coming our way, why are we so doom and gloom whenever the enemy is attacking? You have to be encouraged. You have to be encouraged. You'll show up. We have to be engaged. We have to be this. I, I remember <clears throat> in, in, in watching some of the pro athletes. You can go to any baseball game. And it's really kind of funny because there's an attitude that kind of comes with, with athletes. No, no offense, but there, there's an attitude. Because I remember watching the Braves play. Remember when the Braves were good? No. <laughs> I don't remember that. I, and and the, the other day, I, I was, I was uh, watching something, and, and we were at the Lounge football game, and, and they started playing some music over the speakers, and it was really kind of cool. It's, it's motivational stuff. And uh, for those of you who are truly Christians and admit it, you'll understand ACDC songs. <laughs> the rest of you who don't admit that you've listened to ACDC whenever you were in high school, um, you need Jesus. <laughs> because... They have a song called Thunderstruck. Yes. And it's a really good song. But do you know what I equate that to? Do you remember when John Smoltz was in the bullpen? And all of a sudden he came out and they played that song and you're going, oh, it's lights wow. out. He's going to he mow him over. Space. And he did. He was a great pitcher, great reliever. But you know what? He's an even bigger man than God. 
And so he's in the game. And the, the opposition was we have to change our tactics. We have to understand what's happening because I'm a little bit afraid of that guy. Here's what most Christians are. We just kind of go through it and the enemy goes, yeah, I'm gonna focus on this because we're really not engaged. You know why? Things aren't going our way. This is the way I think it should go. This is the way I think it believes. This is the way I do this. You get the jersey, but you're not in the game. This a true example is, it's very simple because I think Christianity today, we're treating it different. Here's what I got you to Christianity is not a playground. It's a battleground. It's a battleground. I'm standing here today because somebody needs to know the truth about Jesus. Somebody needs to know the truth. And dabbling is the enemy going, I got you. I got you. C.S. Lewis wrote a beautiful book, and it's called The Screwtape Letters, and it's really kind of cool. It's basically uh, the reverse side of Christianity. It, this guy named Wormwood, who is a, a high demon, if you will, in satanic worship. And they talked about with the enemy, Lucifer, of how do you attack a church? If you've got a church of 15 people, and here's what they say, I don't need to get a hold of the 15 people. I need to get a hold of the two deep-rooted Christians. That's all I need to get a hold of. You know why? The 13 other people, they're already playing my game. They're not, they're good, good people, but they're not engaged. So here's what I need to do. I need to engage in battle with these two people that are deeply rooted fighting for Christ because if I can discourage them and the rest can see it, the church will fall apart. So the enemy attacks those who are deep rooted. That's why the scripture says, consider pure joy. Why are you trembling? Why are you worried about this? Why are you this? Why are you that? Understanding. I've always said, if you are doing something amazing for Christ, the enemy is going to come and knock you down. It's a fact. It's a fact. So change is, is this crazy thing. Peter said fiery trials is like, like that he was being literal because among them Nero was doing all this stuff. And, and Peter says do not be surprised at the fiery trials you're facing. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. As if something strange were happening to you. Peter's writing a message in a year that we live would probably adjust it to a different way. If he wrote that today, this is what would probably come out. He would say, don't be surprised if you lose a loved one because of your faith in Christ. Don't be surprised if your family members kind of walk away because you've chosen a life of Christ. Instead of just going, you're putting on the jersey, you're actually getting in the game, you're getting dirty, you're doing the work. You're actually trying to be a Christian and your family goes, why are you doing that? Because this is how we've done it for 50 years. Why are you doing that? Because inside of me is something different. When I was growing up, going on into high school, my parents told me I'd go to any church I wanted to, and I went to a lot of churches because I was trying to find the easiest path. You know what I'm saying. Because I was 16, 17, 18. You know what I mean. Let me, let me break it down for you if you don't know what I'm saying. I went to the church with the best looking girls. <laughs> 16, 17, 18. I'm just, I'm just being real. I was called into the ministry and I ran from that. And I knew that, you know what, if I went to another church, maybe Jesus would uncall me. How'd that work out? How about this? Maybe if you're, if you're in college, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you don't get a second date because your stance on purity. How about this? Don't be surprised that people make fun of you at Thanksgiving because you're following Jesus and you're more engaged in helping others. But this is what we do forever. Don't be surprised, Peter said, at the fiery trial. You're, you're in the game. You're on the front lines. You're making a difference because Christianity is not a playground. We don't dabble in it. It's a battleground. Because there are forces that are fighting for your very soul right now. Some of you are thinking, you know what? I need to make a change. I need to go from religion to relationship. I need to go from, from just doing church to being the church. I need to make a transition from, from whatever it is to this. And how do we do that? Well, number one, you give thanks. Thank you, God. 
Thank you for trusting me. Anytime I go through a struggle and I think I'm down low, I always go back to the book of Job. <laughs> Poor old Job. Job cheers me up. How weird is that, that reading about somebody else's heartache cheers you up? And you're like, wow, he lost everything. He lost everything. But here's what it says. Verse 13. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. New Living Translation, not in NLY. But be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Be glad, be thankful for your persecuted faith. Why is it that so many of us would say, well, I've never really experienced anything like this. I've never really experienced this kind of faith that you talk about. And I'll tell you why. Because we, we have this culture that is so convincing that the most important thing for us is the pursuit of comfort. If you don't believe it, just watch any TV show, any, any um, TV commercial nowadays, especially during the holidays, whenever um, the sacrilegious people that put up the Christmas trees before Halloween... If you guys need Jesus, the altar should be filled today. And if you got yours up before Thanksgiving, well, you're on the right track, but you still need Jesus. <laughs> but what does it say? The person that you're attached to the most won't be proud unless you go $100,000 in debt. You have to buy the love of those. And I don't think that's crazy, the pursuit of comfort. I'll be honest, I would rather have a comfortable conversation with you than one is full-on confrontation. I don't, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'd rather have nice than something that's full of pain. Comfort is something that we also pursue at all costs, even in the name of Jesus. Uh, God, help me have a good day. Uh, bless us, keep us safe. Don't let anything happen to us. God, watch over us today. Bless this food, God. Help our kids, protect us, keep us comfortable, and keep us safe. Essentially, what we want is to avoid conflict at all costs. Let's dodge the opposition. Let's just kind of don't get engaged. Now, I'm not talking about becoming a mean person. What I'm talking about is allowing God to guide you. And whenever people say something, that is, you stand up. I have a lot of chats on Facebook. Now, I don't post it to their wall. I message them. So it's private. Because I've got a lot of friends that are anti-Christians. I've got a lot of friends that are living lifestyles that um, I don't agree with. However, however, I don't hate them. I haven't defriended them. I've got one that kind of looked at me and said, you're kind of being hypocritical, aren't you? And I said, how is that? Well, scripture says, but you like me. And I went, I don't know how to answer that. Scripture says that you don't like my lifestyle, but you like me. And I went, well, Scripture says also the two greatest things that when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandments? He says, love your Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And the second one is, love your neighbor as yourself. What part of that do you not understand? I may not agree with you politically. I may not agree with you biblically. It doesn't mean I hate you. This means we have differing opinions. And so there's a different thing, man, and, and the Christianity box is so put into this little thing. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot put God in a box. You cannot put God in a box. I've had more prayer with people that are not of Christian faith than I can ever, ever, ever imagine doing if I was vocal about this is the way you have to live. If that makes sense. How you handle people is just as important as the problem itself. So you love them unconditionally. No strings attached. Love you unconditionally. It's crazy. Maybe it plays out in different ways. Pursuing comfort. Let me share this with you. When you pursue comfort, there's two ways. You avoid opposition. Your faith weakens. Your life is empty. Um, here's, here's how this kind of kind of plays out. You, you avoid all of this. I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to make anybody mad. You know, just have a good day. But the problem is when you avoid opposition, your faith gets a little weakened. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that. You go, do you go to church? Yeah, yeah, but I don't want to talk about that. Are you a Christian? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? Well, it just means I believe in God. 
And so we don't get any depth. There's no meat to it. You know why? You're on the team, but you sit at the bench, flipping your water bottle, and the enemy's looking at you going, tell them what? Because here's what I want. Trust me when I say this, I had to look in the mirror when I put this down. Trust me when I say this. Because there were times that the enemy looked at me and said, I want you to put the jersey on and pretend you're in the game because I want them to live like you. I want them to live like you. Because you're really not leading anybody to Christ. You're just playing the game. And trust me when I say this, the enemy doesn't care if you go to church. The enemy doesn't care if you sing a song. The enemy doesn't care about that. In fact, he wants you to be here because he wants you to get involved. You know what the enemy worries about? The transformation, the renewing of your mind, the heart for God. All of this is what intimidates the enemy. And he goes, oh no. That person who thought lost the church of Nazarene, you know, they're starting to tell people about Jesus and you're starting to bring people to church and they're starting to tell them we're not a perfect church but we're being perfected and they're starting to lead Bible studies and they're starting to read scripture and they're starting to, to guide people into a, a relationship with Jesus and they're starting to do things and they're starting to take my word at task and they're starting to, to do this and it's really kind of a crazy thing and I'm feeling a little uncomfortable so let's just make something go out. Let's just do something crazy. Let's upset the sound booth. Let's upset the, the air conditioners. Let's make the roof leak. Let's, let's make the debt high. Let's do all of these crazy things. And let's try to, try to turn it so people are, are turning away from and their focus is one degree away from what needs to be. Because I don't want these people catching on fire for Christ. Because if they catch on fire for Christ, this community will be changed. Their life will be changed. And all of a sudden, things are going to be crazy. And all of a sudden, they're going to start tithing. And all of a sudden, people are going to come to Christ. And, and the enemy, God, is going to start winning this battle. And I'm here fighting. And you look at the enemy and go, you've already lost. You just don't know it. You're fighting hard. But I'm not going to be defeated. Because our comfort, for our pursuit of comfort outweighs our pursuit of Jesus. Avoid anything. So, we live boldly. As a Christian, we face opposition. Our faith strengthens. I have no clue. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look into scripture because this is God's word and it never comes void. And God's truth is in all of these words. And so I'm going to come in and I'm going to say, you know what? I need, to, I need to learn about this. I need to study about this. I don't have all the questions. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all this crazy stuff. But I'm going to look at it. And, and, and I'm going to face opposition. No, you're right. Churches are horrible. There's, there's some churches that are doing horrible things in the name of Jesus. They're persecuting people and they're going, calling it faith. And that's not how I see it. Because what you don't see are the people that are volunteering. What you don't see are the people that are giving their life to Christ. What you don't see is that the work is going on and they're not getting recognition. They don't gain credit because we sang the song. If I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. It's not me. This is Christ working in me. I'm to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so I need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. My faith strengthens. Why? Because God is with me. And now I'm drawing closer to Christ. Because I'm starting to understand the mindset of Christ. And so now I'm starting to get this crazy thing that they call, wow. Well, then you wake up and you go, oh my word. How did this happen? I'm so much closer to Christ right now than I've ever been. It's because of the tears of pain you cried. It's because of the trials that you've endured. It's because you, you, you studied the word. It's because now you're team player and you've developed your walk. And now you've got the jersey on and you're in the game. And the enemy goes, we're good as long as you don't put him or her in the game. Because if you got that person teaching Sunday school, these kids are going to learn a lot. If you got that person teaching a small group class, they're going to be really 
And if you got that person teaching elderly people, wow. If you got this person ministering to, wow. Oh. You see? Now we're in the game, and now we understand what God wants us to do. So here's what it says. 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you, and he will never fail you. Never fail you. Let me, let me say this, because it was really interesting. Whenever I became a, a full-time youth minister, I had to, uh, I was in government contracting, had to call my boss and go, Hey, I'm not going to be a government contractor anymore. And he said, Why not? And I said, ah, I'm going into youth ministry. And they go, All right, here's the thing. How much is it going to take? And I went, For what? How much is it going to take for you to remain where you're at? Because we were really doing a good job. And we were one of the top, if not the top shops in the, in the business. And it was just a crazy thing. It was a crazy time, crazy transformation. And I thought, man, eh, I'm not going to do that. We'll double your salary. And I went, hello. <laughs> I'm not going to do that because this is what God called me to do. And he said, what exactly are you going to do? I'm going to go to youth ministry. And he goes, tell me a little bit about youth ministry. And I said, well, it's ministering to youth. It's just helping, you know, kids and he goes, oh, so you're going to be like a glorified gym coach. Okay. I realized right then and there, it's, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And then they, they said this, can you make any money at that? <laughs> yeah, you can. $185 a week. <laughs> Giving up a lucrative, make it $185 a week and a house. That, let's be honest, one match and it would have been gone. <laughs> you know anything about church parsonages? I mean, please, please, Lord Jesus. And they got the guy that, uh, you know, I know how to fix that. <laughs> and I said, no, but here's the thing. God's going to supply our needs. Words out of my boss's mouth. If you're ever needy, and you want to come back, here I am. And this is what I said. I'm pretty sure God said no. And I'm okay. So, went into ministry. Let me fast forward about mm, five years down the road. We're in the ministry making $185 a week. <laughs> Eating baloney. <laughs> Not because we wanted to, because we had to doing some great things, and it was wonderful. It's amazing stuff. I get a phone call from my dad. My dad's like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how to duct tape kids to a wall and keep them there, but other than that, I'm good. <laughs> and he goes, never mind. He said, you got time to talk? And I said, sure. They lived there at that time, and, and we, were, we were going over there, and so I went over. My dad worked for the same company I did. And he said, I have to tell you something. I said, okay, what is it? The company that we work for just went belly up. I said, really? Yeah, but here's the thing. 40 years of my pension is gone because the owner's embezzled every dime. And I have no job. And I have no retirement. You talk about a kick in the gut. And so here I am, a struggling youth pastor, trying to encourage my dad, who is a, uh, he's been a board member. They help build churches. They help so many things. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. And the first time, I've ever seen my dad's eyes tear up. And he said, I don't know what we're going to do. Well, that's a little bit into the, I asked my dad if I could share that story, and he said yes. So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you. For he will never fail you. My dad and I pray. My dad is, is 82 years old. And 
if I'm 82 years old and I have half of his energy, God has blessed me richly. And he's living in a small town. He's doing great. They're doing wonderful. And they made it through. But I want to tell you this. Do what's right and trust God with the results. Do what's right. It would have been easy and easy to walk away. It would have been very easy to just say, I give up. But I was taught years ago by my parents to do the right thing when nobody's looking. It's called integrity. Do the right thing. But I was also taught years ago to get in the game. To get in the game. Because I was reading the scripture and the beautiful scripture for me was, for God so loved this horrible, nasty, terrible world that whosoever believes in him, that whoever believes in the name of Jesus Christ and receives that as their personal Lord and Savior will not perish. But you, after you fought the good fight, after you fought tooth and nail to be a part of the game, not just wear a jersey of Christianity, to get involved, that you will inherit eternal life. That is worth giving thanks for. That alone should be the reason that we want to draw close to him. So endure the trials. Endure the trials. Endure the sufferings. The world will hate you at times. The world's going to turn on you. The world is going to go, but you've never really been persecuted like those overseas. And to listen to missionaries say, I gave up my family because of the pursuit of the call of Jesus Christ. It's really interesting. But to have an opportunity here in Valdosta to be a part of something special and say, God, use me. Use me. is amazing. We pause and we give thanks. And I think the best thing that we could do right now is to receive communion and to have this opportunity to be a part of the entire church and the body and say, I believe. So I'm going to ask my ushers if they'll come. Just go ahead and hand out the juice in the clip right there. And if you'll give me a couple of them, I'll give one to Debbie. You do not have to participate in this. You do not have to be a member of our church. It's okay to say, um, I pass. You know, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus was gathered upstairs with all of his believers, his disciples, if you will. And what's amazing to me is Judas was there. And if you read the scripture in Luke chapter 22, scripture tells us that even though Judas was there, Jesus still washed his feet. Jesus still took that person and said, I know what you're going to do, but before you do that, let me show you something. And he washed the feet of the very person that would betray him. To me, that'd be hard to do. Think about the person that wronged you. And Jesus says, I want you to wash the feet of that person. Uh, I want you to do something good for that person. Uh. And when he got done, he took the outer towel off of his waist. And he said, look. There's some bread that is right there. And he was giving them a glimpse of what is going to happen. I'm going to give you a glimpse into. And he took the bread and he broke it. 
And I can imagine him kind of, as he took this bread and he broke it, he's kind of thinking of the, the punishment that he must endure. Have you ever gone to sleep at night before a big event? You know you gotta get up at 5 a.m. or you gotta be on the road at 5 a.m. You know you gotta do something. And the night before you go to bed at eight o'clock, you're like, I'm gonna get some good sleep. Nine o'clock, you're like, I still got some time. 10 o'clock, you're going, it'll work. Midnight, you're going, I can get four hours. Two o'clock, you're like, what is going on? 3.30, you are snoring like nobody's business. Because you're anticipating. As Jesus was serving, his mind, but he still served. It would have been really easy for him to say, guys, you know what, I can't do this right now. I got something big coming up tomorrow, and you guys don't understand what's happening. The world is going to change tomorrow like you've never believed it. He could have said, you know what, I, I don't have time for this. I just don't have time for this. I, I'm just going to walk away, and you guys do whatever you want to do, and you know, you're not listening to me anyway. You're bickering about who's on my left and who's on my right. He says, you know what, I want to serve this communion thing, and then I'm going to go pray. And then after they served communion, they went and prayed. What did the disciples do? They fell asleep. <laughs> I asked you to do one thing. Just pray for me, and they fell asleep. Why would he do that? Why would he come for us and go through with it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son. And whomsoever should believe in him should not perish. But you'll have eternal life. The words spoken so many years ago are so appropriate for us today. I think we have to pause and give thanks. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus took a little bit of bread and he broke it. And he passed it around the table. And he came to each person. He didn't just say, here, take this, and break off a chunk, and we'll make an image. Jesus passed the bread and he looked in the eyes of each person and he said this, this is going to represent my body that will be broken for you. Even though you pursue comfort, even though Even though you don't want to, I will be broken for you. He looks us in the eyes today and he says, do you believe in my just church attendance more than just being? Am I worth it to you? And I say, absolutely, 100%. I don't want to play the game. I want to be in it. Jesus says, then this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat as it represents what will happen. As they sat there and they kind of visualized, what's he talking about? He says, my blood will be shed. It's going to be the most gruesome death you've probably ever seen in your entire life. He's probably looking at him and going, you really don't have a clue, but you're going to disown me, Peter, three times. You're just, I know what's going to happen. I love you so much that I'm willing to shed my blood for you so that you can get in the game, so that you can be a part of this. I'm willing to shed my blood so that you can have eternal life. All the bickering, all the fighting, all the crazy disciples doing stupid stuff for you, Judas. For you, tax collectors. For you, unclean. For you, heartbroken. For you that are hurting. My blood will be shed for you. 
And he gave him a cup and he said, drink in remembrance of my blood that will be shed. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what God is doing in your life. Maybe you're thinking, you know what? <laughs> I need to be more engaged. I need to really, I need to really get in here. Well, God is calling. And God is crying. And God is here. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. Just kind of bow your head and close your eyes. And just, in just a minute, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to have dinner. And life will go back to normal. And this moment will fly right by. But I really want to ask a question. I want to ask you just bow your head and close your eyes just for a minute. Here's the question, and you need to listen a little bit carefully because I'm not asking you. It would be easy to say, hey, if you want to be engaged, you know, it would be easy to just go, yeah, I want to be engaged. The question becomes this. If you would like to be more engaged than where you're at, would you just quietly slip up your hand so I can see that, so I can pray for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Amazing. Amazing. We're going to say a prayer. And then we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship and worship. I'm going to pray that you will become more engaged, not just a team member, but you're going to be a starter on the front line. That God will equip you like nobody's business. And that you will be a rock star for Jesus. And that you will be the stud athlete. And you'll be the mighty warrior. Not the warrior that comes up and goes, I didn't know they were fighting. I didn't know they were shooting at me. You're going to be the one that goes, you know what? Bring it on. Because I want to stand firm for Christ. And I want to stand firm in my faith. That's what we want. Father God, what a privilege to be in your house today. Thank you so much for the encouragement. Thank you for this time together. God, we, we gave a message about giving thanks. And Father, as we, we checked ourselves and said, I want to be more engaged. We don't know what that looks like. But God, I want to be more engaged. I want to be in the game. Father, I pray for those that raised their hands that said, I want to be a warrior for Christ. I want to be I want to be in the army for Christ. I want to be your hands and feet. I want to be dedicated to you. When opposition comes our way, God, I want to be on the front lines, standing, fighting, saying today, the enemy, you were defeated. You do not belong here. You do not belong in my life. Get away from my family. Get away from my friends. I'm going to be a Christian that takes it to the streets. I'm going to be a Christian that takes up to the front lines. I'm going to stand firm and say no weapon formed against me by a hand of man can cause me to walk away. I'm going to stand firm for Christ. I'm going to make that commitment today. And God, for each person that is praying these prayers, I pray, God, that you will encourage them. And that you, you will be excited about what is happening in the lives of the people that are here. And we are no longer just going through the motions. We are actually suiting up for, for war because we realize this is not a playground. This is a battleground. So God, thank you. Thank you for giving us our marching orders and for giving us a time of fellowship that we can come together. Thank you, God, for all the believers that are here, and thank you for allowing us to be a part of this beautiful thing we call the church. We ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen and amen. We're going to sing a song, and it's a great one, because we're going to raise a hallelujah today. And as we do this, just realize we, we are in a war, and we're going to have a great time. As soon as we're done, we'll say a word of prayer. 
and then we'll eat our food. But let's have a great time and let's worship the King. Father God, we are grateful that you are here. We are grateful that we've been able to worship, celebrate, read scripture, study your word, and 
And God, now as we fellowship, would you bless this food? May it nourish our bodies and help us to have a great time. Enjoy the laughter. Enjoy the conversation. And God, more importantly, enjoy your children in your presence. We ask this in your name. Amen. Give us a minute and the food will be ready. You don't have to leave. Everybody is welcome.